everyone. I hope you've all enjoyed some brunch and are ready for a stimulating 50-minute chat about talent. It couldn't be more pressing, I'm sure you would all agree, more pressing for any company, anyone in this industry, to attract and then retain talent. And I wonder if you think that your industry is different from any others and what your industry can do to create a culture that attracts the best and the brightest. Those are some of the issues we're going to be talking about today. We've got a great panel here to discuss this, a panel that can offer their own unique perspectives on what is happening with talent as we tackle the question, talent hunt, new age crisis or old age problem? Now, I'm going to kick things off with some questions, but if you would like to uh, interact during the panel, I'm happy for you to put up your hand and we'll come to you. Otherwise, there'll be a chance a little bit later uh, for you to ask some questions. But let me quickly introduce you to our great panel that we've got for you today. Jay Altshuler, who is with SAMHSA. Nice to have you with us. Kavita Vasarani from uh, Comcast. Kathy Ring from Starcom. And Henry Price from LinkedIn. Welcome to you all. I wanted to start with a question about talent itself, Kathy. What you think talent is, what you look for when, when you're looking for talent. Well, talent for us is one of the three main pillars of Publicis Media. Um, as we thought about who we are and who we want to be, it's about trust, it's about talent, and it's about transformation. And when you boil it down to those three things, and talent is one of those, clearly it's what differentiates us from our competition, and it's, it's our lifeblood. The talent is what it's about. And I think the most important thing, there's a, a variety of factors, but I would say the most important thing that we look for today in talent is intellectual curiosity. So a curious mind, somebody that always wants to learn, someone that's challenging things, because we work in a business where, um, when, you know, it's, it's tough to get talent, it's tough to keep talent, we're fighting everybody for talent, but to me, when I look at what our opportunities are, a young person can come into the media industry and actually invent the company and invent the solutions. So no longer is it just figuring out what the best tools to use or to put against a situation. You can actually invent the answer and create your own future. And I think that when we're looking for talent, we're looking for people that have that kind of mind and that kind of approach. Are you seeing a shift as well in how people view talent? That it, yeah. it's no longer more rigid categories, that you're looking for someone more well-rounded? I think the, the answer to your question before, it, it's an age-old problem. I think we've always had it. I think the difference is sort of what Kathy's touching on is we're all exposed to now so many more opportunities and so many different companies and cultures, <coughs> you have more choices. And so that makes it obviously much more difficult. I think the type of talent for us, the way, again, I would look at it or approach it would be it's very hard to actually find somebody um, by hiring sort of backwards, which historically we've all done. We've looked at somebody's what somebody has done previously as an indicator to what they can do in the future. The problem is most of the future jobs that Kathy's talking about and the types of work we want to do, these are jobs that haven't been created before, or nobody's done them in the future. Nobody's done them. So you're actually trying to find people that are capable of sort of learning and growing in this dynamic world versus just saying that, oh, I did this in my old job, therefore I will be successful at the new job. That, that actually, that to me as a practice has gone away from the talent acquisition side. And you've got to actually find people that are going to be capable of growing and learning and changing as they go through. Jay, you're nodding. You obviously agree. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I just, uh, you know, kind of building off that, I mean, I, I think that everyone now is, is kind of looking for these multi-hyphenates. You have to wear, you know, four or five hats, and you know I, I think there's something really interesting about you know, kind of working in these these times where, you know, we, we like to say that I mean work has has never been you kind of at this this pace or working at this this crazy pace, but it's probably never going to be this slow again, and and that's the that's kind of the, the scary part. Of it. But, you know, we're living through these really exponential times, and you know I, I think that probably raises the bar for the the type of talent that, uh, that, that we need to, to really thrive in, in the future. I mean, I think a lot of us now feel that we, we all work in the, the innovation business. And in that, this innovation business, it really is about you know, innovation or die. And uh, you know, it's much different than any culture, I think, that, that we've worked in previously. Kavita, how do you see talent? Yeah, you know, I think it's at the core of everything that we do today. It, um, all the things that Kathy even mentioned, 
this intellectual curiosity, um, I say there's a thirst, needs to be a thirst for knowledge and that constant changing, they have to be able to adapt to change. But it's at the forefront of our conversation versus I think historically it's been we have a job opening and you put a job description and you put it out there. After the fact, I think it is at the forefront of what's the specific type of person that we need and it's not necessarily about the skill sets that they had in the past. It's really how can they adapt to the change? How can they work at the pace that we work at and drive that future transformation? And are you able to identify that quickly when you meet someone or when you look at an application? You can, um, but it takes a lot more people to go through. So I think it takes longer time. You can see it. You can see so when someone comes in and they have the right skill set and they've had the right experience in the past, but we're not sure if they can close the gap between bringing the various pieces together. It's, it's you need these collaborators that can work across many different fields and very different functions of the organization. Um, so you can tell, but it, it's you have to process through a lot more talent to get that. Happy, how does it work in terms of recruitment with HR, with you, with your clients? Uh, I, I think that we're, there's not one person anymore. There's not one skill set. We're curating a team. So we're cur like. Kavita talked about collaboration, right? We're curating a team of people with different skill sets that bring something different to the party, and it's the orchestration of them together against a given client. That's where the magic is. So I think that we work very closely with HR in terms of identifying that, and, and sometimes really pushing ourselves outside of our comfort zone to bring in people and identify people that will bring something new, right? Because to be successful, you surround yourself with people different than you, and you have different points of view and different skill sets, right? And you're always balancing expertise with integration. But to, be, the, to have people with different expertise and integrating together is the answer. So having to work very closely, push ourselves, go outside of normal boundaries. To just bring the HR people. conversation, just to jump on that, I was talking to your colleague earlier about the HR organization usually sits outside of the marketing organization, so they're not always as abreast of all the things that are happening. So we've started to bring them into the marketing organization and even, in, I think, engage with the meetings that we have, engage with the staff meetings so that they can hear the discussions we're having about talent and the type of people because what was happening, we found when HR is sitting out here, you're putting these job descriptions together and then you get the resumes back and it's not the, it's not the right there's fit. No there, it's, yeah. There's no marriage. So to bring them into the conversation so they understand <laughs> what is going on with the landscape. Yeah, for me it's really interesting because HR is on, the executive, on my executive team HR is next to us every single day. You could argue that HR is the most important job we have because if we believe that talent is our differentiator, you know, you have to be in lockstep and you're working together to identify who your team is and curate it properly. So I, I'm used to them sitting right next to you and is a partner in what you do every day. I, I think a part of this is around, um, you know, a term we're all now very familiar with, but it's relatively new over the last few years around talent brand, which is, you know, it's not just about the process of acquiring somebody to come work at your company. There's actually a higher order here, which is actually explaining from an awareness perspective, what is it like to come work here? Why should you come to work here? What is, the, what is my purpose for being there? How do I, as an individual contributor, connect to the overall mission of the company? And so there's, to me, there's a sort of before I get into the process of just the acquisition pipeline of a rec recruiting candidates, it's how do I make sure that my story for my company is being told to the right individuals, to the right people around the world, wherever I may be recruiting, around a sense of purpose so then they can connect to me a lot easier. And is that what people want now, particularly younger people? Are they looking at the company and going, is there a sense of purpose there? That, I think it's, yeah. I mean, yeah. I love yeah. Jay, but it's, it's, if I, to me again, as a, you say millennial, but I even say it's more than millennials. People want to connect to a sense of purpose. That's a great change, David. How do you do that at Samsung? How do you convince yeah. people you have a higher purpose? Yeah, well, I mean, you, you have to, to live the space. But, you know, we've, um, we've spent uh, a good amount of time building a, a new marketing playbook. 
and um, you know, we, we always say that, that Samsung is not uh, a set of products to buy, but a high order idea to buy into. And you know, we really like to position the, the brand and, and the business kind of at this intersection between technology and humanity and purpose of driving culture. And you know, ultimately, uh, you know, we, we felt that the, one of the best ways to do that was, was to you know, build uh, an experiential space. So um, you know, anyone that goes back to New York, please come down to 837 Washington, right across <laughs> from the, the standard. But it, it really is the, the physical manifestation of the, of the brand and the business. And um, you know, everything that, uh, that we believe and that we talk about, all of our ideals are you know, done through the, the physical space itself. But I wonder how competitive it is then for all of you to try and convince people to come and work for you when you're all out there sort of pushing the same kind of message. Yes, um, and you know, for, for Comcast, you know, we don't have a good history of having a good consumer brand. And so creating that shift, that's where purpose becomes more and more important. And so we talk a lot about our employees and we talk a lot about how this company came to be. And there is power to that. It was the American dream and it was such an inspiration to a lot of the new folks that are coming in to see where that came from. And does that resonate with people? I'm sorry? Does it resonate with you? It, slowly. I will say it, it is still hard. I think what um, the younger generation actually, I think, resonate, it resonates more than the folks that have grown up with Comcast being their local cable provider. I think they see the innovation that we're bringing to the table. They see the shift that's being created. And we're this major organization, but we have an entrepreneurial field within the organization that comes right from the leadership. And I think the leadership has recognized that we have to create a sense of purpose. And we have to think differently about our organization in terms, whether it's titles, whether it is workspace. So we're creating different types of workspace. But it is a shift. It is a like shift. The physical space is changing. Yes, the physical space is changing. Location. you know remote working, those are just new concepts to the organization. And I wonder, Jay, you obviously produce some really cool stuff. That's one great yeah. message that you've got. What about company culture, though? I mean, how do you sell that to someone that you want? Right yeah. Uh, you know, we, we have this uh, you know, kind of concept of, of living the, you know, the galaxy life. And, uh, you know, we, we really believe in, in our brand and in the business and, and uh, doing by, by living through it. And you know, we, we probably put on about uh, you know seventy to hundred experiential events a, a year. I mean, we're we really believe in, in the power of, of you know driving culture, um, not necessarily even just being part of that culture. And so you know, again, that's part of you know, kind of the, the physical space, and you know, also just being a, a technology brand in itself. You know, is culture. Everybody has has phones. You know, a lot of people are talking about VR and three hundred and sixty, and to be a, a company that is on the, the bleeding edge of developing the, this technology, uh, I think makes a, a big difference in being able to um, attract the right talent, but even just being in the consideration set to, to begin with. I mean, it, it really helps that you know, most people have our, our brand either inside their pocket or inside their, their home to begin with. Can you tell us if what millennials want is different from other people? When I was looking into the panel, I wrote down in my notes, young people, millennials, you know, <laughs> and slightly shaken, thinking how well do we really understand them, and what is it that they want that's different? Again, I don't think it's necessarily they want something different, they may expect something different, because their experience to date has been different than ours was, as we were growing up, sort of, sort of charting our own path for a career, our opportunities were potentially geographically limited, it's where we live, it's where we wanted to work, we may have had uncles or aunts or family that worked somewhere or in some industry sort of directed our career. That is different. They, they, to me, millennials and even now Generation Z, I think, is looking at this as I can work anywhere and do anything, but what they do want to attach to, again, is a culture that actually listens and sort of answers what their dream is, which is obviously to be much more active in sort of with a sense of purpose, contributing to a greater good I think it's very much what, um, again, I think more than just millennials, but I do think that's a real driver of how people choose. And what about other things like just flexible working, all those things that I we always are, thought people wanted? Those, those are important to have. I don't think they're necessarily going to, you know, make somebody come to work for us. I think that's a nice element to have. What I think more people want to is attached to is what does the executive leadership team of this company believe? 
What are they striving to build? What is the culture that they are creating? Because I do think it comes from the executive leadership team of any company. And, and do I see myself connecting with that purpose? Do I want to contribute to what that mission means? That to me is, I think, more powerful than a flexible work schedule or a certain amount of extra pay or something like that. This is a lot, Kathy. No, I that agree. Is, yeah. saying that yeah. people want. I mean, yeah. how do you deliver I, I think people want to be part of something, right? They want to be part of something and they want to believe that what they're doing makes a difference and matters. And that can mean different things to different people. And in one way, with the millennials, it's easier, not harder because they believe that part of their responsibility is to curate their own career. So they're in, 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 and maybe it's a shorter time period, and maybe they're looking for an experience and going to the next experience, but they're there believing that they're going to learn and they're going to contribute, and that's what they want to do, and they're constructing their path. And, how, and now I've learned this, where do I want to go next to learn? And we have a bit of an advantage in that as being on the agency side because we work with phenomenal brands and we can give people different experiences. If we do it right with millennials and we help them curate their path, we can keep them in our company because we have so much latitude, different things to work on, different brands, different categories, different areas of specialty and the ability to work across things and bring it all together where it's whether it's content or technology or data or you know so, and so it's 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 great if we do it right, but we definitely have to help these people be the best they can be because that's what they expect. So is it harder to attract them then? rather Because you're saying re retaining them is not so bad. I think, what about actually getting them? Yeah, I think it's a fight. I think it's a dog fight to get that curious person who's going to solve problems. And I, yeah, think, it's, yeah, yeah. I think it's really hard to, to attract them and have them choose you. And like I said before, I think our advantage is you, you can create your own path, and we're creating new solutions every day. So it's not like you're going into a job where you're locked and loaded, and here's your description, and here's what you're going to do. Because if you do that, you're going to fail, right? Mm -hmm. And that's not what we're looking for. So that person who's looking for that, like, not everybody fits in every company. That company cultures are different. The environment's different. And that's a huge reason for them yeah. to pick us, too. Yeah. But not just us to pick them. They have to pick us. But I wonder, Kavita, it must be exhausting thinking there's a blank sheet every day and people can reinvent themselves yes. every day. I mean, every single that's day. That's tiring. Yes. I mean, I think in an agency like MediaVest, it's... You know, you have the opportunity to work on different accounts and potentially bring new ideas to the table. But within our organization, you're working to drive Xfinity. You're driving one thing. But there's many dimensions to that one thing. But how do you bring those dimensions to life? I think um, what we need to, as, as an organization, do is learn. Learn from the millennials and keep an open mind so they come with this desire to learn, this desire to experiment, and not as afraid of failure as a lot of the folks that have been in the organization. And you know, we have folks at the organization that have been tenured, they've been there for 20 plus years. How do you get them to change into a different way of thinking? So it's, it becomes really hard when you're trying to come to work and saying, okay, now how do you do this differently? The good news is, there is so much happening in our industry. There is so much happening in terms of how video is consumed, how internet is part of our lives and we're in people's homes. So there is an opportunity. It's, it, it just, how do you bring it to life for them? You know, just, just building on that, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, we also have a, you know, kind of a it's a multinational corporation. Yeah. You know, people have been there many, many years. We instituted uh, kind of this reverse mentoring program yeah. Just that, that same sort of concept. There's so much that uh, we can learn. There's you know kind of a group of, of you know kind of digital natives that come into the company that have just been born with it. There's you know kind of a, a senior management set that happen to know it because their their kids are kind of of that age and that's the only way they can communicate yes. with them. But then there's you know kind of everybody else in the middle, and we we found there's kind of this uh, technology gap even inside a, a technology company. Uh, and so we, we is do it an great age thing? Yeah, do you think part of it is a is an age thing and just a comfort level. With the technology, and so you know, again, that's you know, part of the, our brand mission is to, you know, sit at this this intersection between technology and humanity, and to try and, um, you know, reduce some of that friction, that daily friction that people have with technology, and that's why we we institute kind of reverse mentoring, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and take these digital natives and, and, and bed them with some of our kind of middle management and senior management, so they, they really understand and get comfortable with the, the new technology. How important do you think leadership is? Uh, yeah, from an from a establishing culture, establishing purpose, I think it's all about leadership. 
Um, and I think I, <laughs> Kathy knows it. I, you know, again, I think this is a, this is our number one job as sort of leaders of any teams, of any organizations, of any companies is is around talent. And I would say, uh, you know, the discussion we've had so far is centered around acquisition mostly. I think when you look at the numbers. You know, actually what we should spend time on, again, not necessarily just panel-wise, but ourselves, is around retention and development. Because at any given time, a company's growing maybe 5 or 10% on an annual basis from a headcount perspective. What matters most is the 95 or 90% of people that are on your team and trying, as Kathy said, to curate our career. You've got to help them develop. And that's the pressure I think most of us will feel over time is the obvious skill gap that's there today, meaning what most of our teams are working on every day, to the actual jobs that are going to be empowering and productive and the ones that matter in the future, how do we help them as employees become empowered and deliver on their development to get those jobs in the future? I mean, not to be old-fashioned about it, but do you think sometimes expectations are too high then, Kathy, from employees? Well, I, I, I grew up at Leo Burnett where it was the, you know, the highest bar none and you were reaching for the stars every day in excellence. So. You know, I'm, I'm not sure that anything is, is too high for what we're going to strive to do. Um, I do think sometimes, sometimes the failure, you know, we're going to fail and failing is okay. Maybe that's why I'm a little old-fashioned because I can't really imagine going to one of our clients and going, oh, we just failed. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Like, but, but I think that with the younger end and the millennials, what's different is that it's how they, what failure is or isn't because failure isn't trying something new and it doesn't work. Failure is not trying it, right? So like what failure really means I think is very different and I think that the way that um, the millennials have grown up is you just even think about how I would approach playing a video game versus they're playing a video game. I'm gonna get in level one, I'm gonna find out how to beat it, how to get to the end, what is the most efficient, expedient way to do it, and I'm gonna do it, achieve it, and go to the next level. I'm not gonna wander around in there and look for coins and cookies and just have the experience and see where it takes me and die a few deaths and get to the next level. But that's how they approach life, and that's wonderful because again, failure is different. It's not failure, it's experiences. It's having different experiences and learning from everything you do and exploring all the boundaries and the corners. And that's great for our industry because that's the exact attitude, that's the exact culture we need to be successful. Yeah. Let's talk a bit more about retention then. What needs to happen in, in your mind to, to retain people? Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I the think, best people. Yeah, it's you know all the things that we've talked about, but it's... Um, for me, it is building that purpose and not being closed in to, you know, when we do our high, high potential employee valuations with HR and talent management to say, okay, I'm going to put this person in this box and if there's a retention risk, I'm going to rate them a different way. Just for my group, it has to be broader than that. And I think so we have to be open to say, okay, if there is a tremendous talent in my organization, how does that translate to potentially other functions? And how do we bring people from other functions into here, right? So there's you know, so, so many digital specialists that come into our world. There's so many traditional media or TV specialists, but there's that gap in between that's the integrator. And those can exist in many parts of the organization. To, so just open up open up the field and say, there's a talent pipeline here for an individual that's coming in within the entire organization, not just within the media group or the marketing group. And Jay, do you think the challenges in, in your industry are different? Or do you think that this is what everyone's facing in uh, all industries? I think everyone's facing this. I think we, we all face it maybe in, in different uh, degrees and manifestations, but you know, it, it just, the world is, is so connected and uh, you know, there's so much transparency that, you know, I, I think it's actually, it's very empowering um, for, for any, any worker at this point. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a really, it's a great time to, to be working, um, you know, not only because we can all kind of create the, the future that we want to see, uh, you know, and we can you know, really feel empowered to kind of create our, our own career, but, uh, you know, just the, the tools that, that we have to, to deliver on that promise today, I, I think is, is really exciting. And, you know, I think that that is part of the, the mindset. I mean, you know, we, we talk about the, the cultures that we build to try and retain the, the best talent, but, 
you know, part of the, the new reality is the, the fact that, um, you know, there's probably more, more dating and, and less commitment mm -hmm. in this world. And, and, and that's just part of the reality. And I think, you know, kind of going in with that expectation that, you know, maybe the, the dynamics ha have changed between kind of employee and employer is, is okay. Is that true? Do you think this industry faces the same challenges? Or are, are there unique things happening in this industry in terms of talent retention, particularly, that you don't see elsewhere? Um, it's hard to not know all the other industries. So you, you may even have a much better perspective. I would just say that I would imagine we all face similar challenges, if not exactly the same. And I do think the notion of um, you know, sort of what Kavita is saying around the, your best talent, what do you do with your best talent, is probably something we all face, any industry, which is, you know, historically we may have, as a leadership team, talked about this talent group and said, okay, at some point I want to give this person another opportunity or I want to move them into a new group or a new account or whatever it might be. I think today's expectations are that actually you're going to talk to that talent. Tell them that they are a top talent. Tell them that you've got a plan for them. Work on a two-year plan or a year plan, whatever the time frame is. This is what we're going to do together. This is what I'm asking of you to give back to me. So I think to me around this, the notion of talent retention or development is around transparency, around really being upfront about it and making a, if it's a verbal commitment, it's probably not a written commitment. It can be. But a verbal commitment with that employee to say, we're going to work together to build you into your next opportunity. And it could be here, or it could be somewhere else. But I'm going to invest in you. I need you to invest in me, and we're going to do it together. Kathy, do you think there's also a difference between what an agency wants and what a client wants and yes. needs? So it's really interesting, because you say rotating and rotating to a different piece of business. But if I ask Jay or Kavita, they're rock stars on their business. They really kind of sort of don't want them going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but. But by the same token, I think we're in a, a different level of understanding and partnership with our clients where we can have the discussions about this person's phenomenal, we want to keep them within our company, we have another phenomenal person we're going to give you. And this understanding that yes, we need to rotate that person because we need to give them a different opportunity, right? And probably the best kind of mix for our superstars is like a 20, 20, 60 job. So like, 20% of what they know for sure, cold, that they're an expert in. 60% of where they're learning and, and having, you know, slightly new experience. And then 20% of stuff they don't know at all. That's totally new to learn that pushes. And to the extent that we want to keep people, we need to keep our eye on that 20% and make sure that they always have a chance to invent and do something different. Even if they're staying on the same client, you know, and on the same team, there's still that room for invention and pushing, and I think that's really important and for attention. Kathy, don't, don't you find that, um, you know, kind of sitting at, at the agency side, almost kind of in the, the epicenter, there's a, a lot of flexibility in, you know, how we can kind of, quote unquote, rotate. You know, Absolutely. You can kind of mm -hmm. embed into a, a publisher side for six months, mm -hmm. coming over the, the client side. I mean, there, there's very, you know, just interesting options that, that we have these days, you know, with, with talent, just to, to kind of put them down different paths, even without having to, to leave the agency. And even adjusting the team based on a great person that you bring in that has a certain skill set, we're actually able to work with our client and kind of adjust what's around that person to do something maybe a little different, but that keeps us moving forward. Yeah. And Kavita, what do you think the expectations are on both sides about a work-life balance and how that sort of plays out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what is that? I, I think most people understand now that that's not reality. You try to do the best at work and you try to do the best at home. And you, There is no balance. There is, there is, you know, I think you create your own balance. I, I use this principle with my life where there are so many balls you're juggling, juggling all the time and you have to identify how many of those are rubber balls versus made of glass because the one you drop, that's glass. It's going to take a harder time to fix. Right. So that's the perspective that I live by. And if there's something going on at home that I feel is going to fall apart if I'm going to focus on this, then I say, OK, no, that's made out of glass right now. I better focus on that. And, and vice versa. There are times at work where I just need to make it a priority. So I think about work-life balance from that perspective. And it's, it's situational. There are days you know, technology. can't can be an enabler to yeah. this, right? I mean, yeah. you know, we all have you know, kind of just fluid yeah. uh, offices with a, a 
laptop and Wi-Fi or a phone. I mean, you know, here we are. FaceTime. This is an yeah. office. Yes. Don't you think millennials do expect to have some bit more of a balance? Uh, I'm almost, I'm almost I, surprised. I, if yeah, I mean, I think balance is the wrong word. I, I yeah. think that's, it puts too much pressure on ourselves to know there's 24 hours in a day, and if I'm working for 10 hours, there's just, basically there's no balance, it's not balance. So, you know, we look at it from a, a harmony perspective. If you can live across these worlds in some kind of harmony, and sometimes it's gonna be stretched one way or another, I think that's the reality of it. And, and again, I, I think we all probably came into the last few years, five, 10 years of hearing about this millennial generation that they don't wanna work, they don't wanna work very hard, they have high expectations. Yeah. They want to get promoted every year. They want to go on some kind of service trip and help others. Uh, I actually find that to be not true. I think mm -hmm. that some of the teams that we have that are you know, younger uh, are highly motivated to work, highly motivated to contribute, and, and frankly do many more things that others can't do. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if they expect balance per se. I think they expect um, to be empowered to contribute. And again, at certain times they're going to say, I don't want to contribute at work right now. I'm going to go do this other thing for a few hours or a day, or I'm going to take extra time off uh, to do some other calling that I want to do. But I'm going to come back more motivated, more engaged, more empowered to do things at work. So I think and that's it's okay. no different. Yeah. It, it has to be. That's part but of the culture. But they're making the decision. But that's the mm -hmm. thing. That's like, part of the culture we've got to all create yeah, because yeah, enable that to, to happen. To your point, Pender, I mean, you know, if you're joining a company for that high, higher order purpose, that's aligning to their, yeah. their personal belief system. And so it's not work-life balance more, it's work-life work -life integration. Yeah. So even you know, what you're, you're doing with your passions feed into you know, the, the professional hat that you wear. So there, there's really not that, that separation. But I think your point, it, it is their choice. So it's different, the, the dialogue's different and the conversation's different because they're choosing their path. And I, I think there is work-life balance, but I think you have to look at it across 20 years not across one week. So sometimes you're all in in work and you're in a new job and that's what you're doing 22 out of 24 hours a day. And sometimes you're in a place where you can take more time at home or you can go on a sabbatical. So to try to make your work and your life balance on a daily or a weekly basis I think is impossible. I think it's across a span and I think the millennials go in knowing that and they know what they want to give but they also are consciously saying okay now this is my next thing and this is where I'm going to concentrate on. So they're they're more purposeful about it than perhaps it used to be. Mm -hmm. Are there burning questions from the audience? Anyone got a quick? Yes. Hang on a minute, we've got a microphone coming to you. Is it? Perspective on how diversity um, is important within the, the talent hunt. It's, that's such a great question that's because great it's question. the only one I hadn't asked that I was saving for this 10 minutes if none of you had questions. Yes. Diversity and I think gender as well. Yeah. And Based, age, yeah. actually, I, yeah. because we've spoken a lot about millennials, but actually what's the other end of the spectrum about yeah. uh, the aging population? Kathy? And, and I think for us, like, diversity is key because the whole idea is to have people from different walks of life, different experiences, different ages, different cultures, all working together on a problem, right? And I know people talk a lot about the, the male-female balance as well, and in media, we're at, at Starcom, I think we're 62% women, um, which is kind of amazing. Um, and we have great men. So, I mean, we're all working together. It's not like it's, you know, um, I've worked for men. An I've worked for women. Row. You know, I said, yeah, Bob says, I've only ever worked for Stand women. Up. Somebody Stand else up, says, I've only ever bow. worked for men. Um, I've been lucky to, to work across the spectrum. But I think diversity is important. And what is just as important is the ability and the respect and the desire to want to be around a mix of different people, right? And to value that, right? And to be in a place where you can go as far as your own skills and desires and ability and sacrifices take you. And my experience, luckily, has been that's the truth. That's why I've been at the same company so for, many, so, for so many years, because I don't have to go somewhere else to get a different experience. And I truly feel like you can go as far as you want based on what you're willing to give and what you're willing to do. And that's a pretty special culture to be in. Yeah, and Kavita, could you perhaps address the other end of that question, which is you wanted to ask about old, 
can we say older, more experienced more people? people in the workplace? <laughs> we're not that old. What is, what is the expression? We're not that old. <laughs> more mature, that's right, more experienced. No, I, I think of, you know, it's, it's diversity of thought, and you Absolutely. need both of that. You need all kinds on your team. Um, one of the things on our team we infused over the past couple of years is a very strong data and analytics mindset to a very strategy, planning, creative group. And so to infuse that into a creative group was difficult at first. But I think the beauty of diversity of thought is new ideas come to the table. And folks who have been on the television side, for example, can bring a lot to the table when you were talking about online video. And on the flip side, data can bring a lot to how we create our strategies to reach consumers. So I think it's diversity of thought, and I think there's a place for everybody in this organization. I mean, I think if you think about Uber, they created a platform for every walk of life, every, you know, every, land, every career path. It's just offering a different perspective to the, to the future. I think one thing to address this also very directly would be um, how you recruit differently. I think many of us recruit in the same pools of our same behaviors, our same networks, which causes this problem to continue, I think. The other thing is, um, you know, if you think about sort of unconscious bias, many of us in roles where we are either hiring managers or leaders or some sort have a very clear unconscious bias that we just don't really understand. And so being exposed to these various groups whoever they may be, and making sure you understand all of these experiences, all of what's happening, actually from their point of view, is really, really important to understand actually what's happening. Because you may have your own opinion, you may feel like, oh, I'm doing all the right things, and my candidate pool is becoming more diverse, and I'm, but actually you're not really getting to the root of the problem, which is many leaders still have a very clear unconscious bias they're not aware of, and so they're not really fixing the underlying circumstances. So you're all very busy executives and you have lots of meetings throughout your day, partners and clients and agencies and vendors and customers. How do you make time for talent and how, do you, how much of your time do you spend um, each day talking, nurturing, dealing with talent and how do you carve out that time to make it a priority? Yeah, no, I, it's, a, it's a great question and I think that, that is probably one of the, the daily tensions of a, of a manager. Uh, and especially kind of going back to that point that I think, you know, we're, we're moving faster and, and uh, having to wear more hats than, than ever. Um, you know, I, I think part of that is, is also just um, having the, the right physical space to, to work in. Uh, you know, we, we happen to work in a space that, that's all very open. And, you know, I, I think there's something very powerful in, in just the entire team sitting together. So again, I think it goes back to the, the, um, the point of just integration. So when everybody's sitting together and kind of working together, there's probably less, you know, kind of discussions, you know, specific discussions that you need to, to have on you know, talent and culture when everybody's just uh, living it every day. But, you know, with, with that said, um, you know, on a, on a quarterly basis, you know, we, we formalize the process to have these discussions. And, you know, it's, it's very detailed. There's one-on-ones, there's, you know, top-up, there's bottom-down, and, and kind of 360. So it's, it's really important uh, for us. And I think it goes back to kind of what everybody's saying and just having that diversity of, uh, of talent, is that it creates this, this beautiful kind of virtuous circle that I think actually helps with some of that, that bias. So when you are kind of reviewing or hiring, you, know, you have a point of view, but you're actually getting you know, kind of that diversity of, of thought from all of your peers. And you know, it's amazing when you know, everybody sits with kind of incoming talent, you know, kind of the different perspectives that they have in, in those interviews that you just wouldn't even um, have thought of it if you're just doing it kind of one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, I mean, I would just add to this, um so with our current talent, that's transparency is key. They, you know, I think HR may say you shouldn't tell them what nine box rating they fall under, but I think it's really, they know. They, your talent knows, so having a transparent conversation around that, but then also making a commitment, which is something that I've personally done, is to reverse mentor, and that is, so eye-opening, you learn so much about what's happening in other industries and what, the, what that purpose is. 
Um, so you can find the right opportunities for them, but it is, you know, it is a daily conversation that we're having, especially in the media industry. Yeah, I think it's a really tough question because you only have so much time in a day, right? And how are you going to spend that time? And for me, what I've tried to do is find a group of people, when you have more than a thousand people, right? How big is that group? But people that you see that are the future, that have the latitude and the ability, and to really spend personal time coaching them and frankly in the trenches with them. So sometimes reaching down and being part of the team and working next to them and helping them solve a problem and real life mentoring by example. And you can't do that with 1,500 people, right? So part of it is making a choice of where you're gonna invest and then the, the people that work with you, having them all do the same thing. So that you're, you're kind of building this crop of the, the future executives. But it's hard to do, because you only have so much time and so many choices. So I think being purposeful about it and really trying to grow the next group and spend your own personal time with them is important. If there aren't any others, I've got just one final classic end of panel <laughs> question to ask all of you, which is advice. From, and, and take a, what it, a, the best piece of advice you have from either side, whether it's someone looking to get in or whether it's about retaining talent, Kavita? I would say have an open mind and this notion of diversity of thought. I think it's really important to understand that when you're talking to people, when you're going into an organization, those are the things to look for because that speaks volumes about the chemistry of the team, what they're able to accomplish together. And these, you could be the future executive of another organization or they're the future executive of our organization. And I think it's to have an open mind that diversity of thought is really critical. Top that. <laughs> no, I, I really encourage uh, everyone that, that I work with just to be very present uh, you know, in, in their, and, and purposeful in, in their work. And you know, I, I think there's, you know, the, the days are tough, it can be very stressful, and um, you know, big companies uh, you know, tend to have uh, a lot of these processes that were done in the top nine box and all of that. But you know, ultimately, I, I think if you are bringing your, your best self uh, you know, every day to work and you know, come in with that, that positive attitude and you're, you know, and, and you really believe in that that high order of purpose. The rest of it kind of just falls away, and it's just amazing what happens when you come in, you're kind of purposeful and, and present. Um, you know, you really bring your, your best self to uh, to the organization every day. I, I would just say uh, transparency around your talent development. You know, be very transparent with your leaders of your organization, and work on work with them to build their next uh, step of their career. I would say hire for the why. The person who asks why, who wants to know why, nurture the why, encourage the why, and reward the why. So have an organization of people who ask why, who don't work on any project unless they know why and how it fits in, and then reward that. Comes back to curiosity, doesn't it? Yep. My favorite word in the English language. Anyone got any final questions? There'll be a little bit of time now, obviously. Thank you all very much. That was a fascinating panel. I hope you all enjoyed it.